Imagine with me for a moment, if you will. You're the ultimate creator, a scientist, a man of knowledge. And you think to yourself, I should dig up a corpse and see if I can bring it to life. And then after that, maybe I'll be like super stoked about making a female version of it and uh, let them hang out together and see what happens. Thus is the story of Frankenstein. Mary Shelley, in like 1818, wrote an amazing story of a scientist who was a little bit demented, but thought about maybe taking the body parts of someone from the earth and reanimating that person with lightning from the sky. And, and you've all seen, at least, parts of that old Boris Karloff movie where Frankenstein cobbles together a big old monster and then lights it on fire with lightning screams something like it's alive and it gets up and it ponderously walks around so he's successful but this thing is gruesome right it's stitched together it's not attractive to look at and it's super clumsy and dumb but today's video i'm hoping to kind of illuminate a couple things first off we've been in a series of videos where we've speculated what it would be like to have the monster in the monster story be some kind of Disney princess. And of course, the, the normal villain of that story or film to be the person meant to hunt her. So in this case, I wanted to do something about Frankenstein, one of my favorite like creature features from back in the day when I was a kid. But since it's a princess, I thought, shoot, I really don't want to make it like Big Ugly Frankenstein. But then I remembered the weird, dumb sequel to that film. So I chose to do Tiana from The Princess and the Frog. And the weird, dumb sequel was called Bride of Frankenstein. And so I thought this would be perfect. I'll do her as the Bride of Frankenstein and Dr. Facilier, or however you say his name, as the Dr. Frankenstein. Side note, people call the big monster Frankenstein, and for some reason it bothers me and a horde of other nerds throughout the world. It is not Frankenstein, it is Frankenstein's monster. The guy who created the monster It's you know, just, I digress. Tiana will make a wonderful bride of Frankenstein. Uh, there are a few things that I hope to to kind of accomplish in this film. One is to just kind of entertain with kind of the speculation that I typically do with these paintings. One of the other things I'd like to do in this one is to kind of dispel some of the myths. Because not just the whole Frankenstein, Dr. Frankenstein, Frankenstein's monster thing. But if you read the actual Mary Shelley story from 1818, it is very different than that movie. Let me read a quick bit and then we can talk about the differences between them. Yep, I'm reading again. As I said this, I suddenly beheld the figure of a man, at some distance advancing towards me with superhuman speed. He bounded over the crevices in the ice, among which I had walked with caution. His stature, also as he approached, seemed to exceed that of a man. I was troubled. A mist came over my eyes, and I felt a faintness seize me, but I was quickly restored to the cold gale of the mountains. I perceived, as the shape came nearer, sight tremendous and abhorred, that it was the wretch whom I had created. I trembled with rage and horror, resolving to wait his approach and then close with him in mortal combat. He approached. His countenance bespoke bitter anguish, combined with disdain and malignity, while its unearthly ugliness rendered it almost too horrible for human eyes. But I scarcely observed this. Rage and hatred had at first deprived me of utterance, and I recovered only to overwhelm him with words expressive of furious detestation and contempt. Devil, I exclaimed, dare you approach me, and do not you fear the fierce vengeance of my arm wreaked on your miserable head. Be gone, vile insect, or rather, stay, that I may trample you to dust. And oh, that I could, with the extinction of your miserable existence, restore those victims whom you have so diabolically murdered. I expected this reception, said the demon. All men hate the wretched. How then must I be hated, who am miserable beyond all living things? Yet you, my creator, 
detest and spurn me. Thy creature, to whom thou art bound by ties only dissoluble by the annihilation of one of us. You propose to kill me. How dare you sport thus with life? Do your duty towards me, and I will do mine towards you and the rest of mankind. If you will comply with my conditions, I will leave them and you at peace. But if you refuse, I will glut the maw of death until it be satiated with the blood of your remaining friends. Abhorred monster, fiend that thou art, the tortures of hell are too mild a vengeance for thy crimes. Wretched devil, you reproach me with your creation. Come on then, that I may extinguish the spark which I so negligently bestowed. My rage was without bounds. I sprang on him, impelled by all the feelings which can arm one being against the existence of another. He easily eluded me and said, Be calm. I entreat you to hear me before you give vent to your hatred on my devoted head. Have I not suffered enough? That you seek to increase my misery? Life, although it may only be accumulated of anguish, is dear to me, and I will defend it. Remember, thou hast made me more powerful than thyself. My height is superior to thine, my joints more supple. But I will not be tempted to set myself in opposition to thee. I am thy creature, and I will be even mild and docile to my natural lord and king, if thou wilt also perform thy part, to which thou owest me. O Frankenstein, be not equitable to every other and trample upon me, to whom thy justice and even thy clemency and affection is most due. Remember that I am thy creature. I ought to be thy Adam, but I am rather the fallen angel, whom thou drivest from joy for no misdeed. Everywhere I see bliss, from which I alone am irrevocably excluded. I was benevolent and good. Misery made me a fiend. Make me happy, and I shall again be virtuous. Be gone. I will not hear you. There can be no community between you and me. We are enemies. Be gone, or let us try our strength in a fight in which one must fall. How can I move thee, with no entreaties cause thee to turn a favorable eye upon thy creature, who implores thy goodness and compassion? Believe me, Frankenstein, I was benevolent. My soul glowed with love and humanity, but am I not alone? Miserably alone? You, my creator, abhor me. What hope can I gather from your fellow creatures, who owe me nothing? They spurn and hate me. The desert mountains and dreary glaciers are my refuge. I have wandered here many days, the caves of ice, which only I do not fear, and are a dwelling to me, and the only one which man does not grudge. These bleak skies I hail, for they are kinder to me than your fellow beings. If the multitude of mankind knew my existence, they would do as you do, and arm themselves for my destruction. Shall I not then hate them who abhor me? I will keep no terms with my enemies. I am miserable, and they shall share my wretchedness. Yet it is in your power to recompense me and deliver them from an evil which it only remains for you to make so great, that not only you and your family, but thousands of others shall be swallowed up in the whirlwinds of its rage. Let your compassion be moved, and do not disdain me. Listen to my tale. When you have heard that, abandon or commiserate me, as you shall judge that I deserve, but hear me. The guilty are allowed, by human laws, bloody as they are, to speak in their own defense before they are condemned. Listen to me, Frankenstein. You accuse me of murder, and yet you would, with a satisfied conscience, destroy your one creature. Oh, praise the eternal justice of man. Yet as I ask you not to spare me, listen to me. And then, if you can, and if you will, destroy the work of your hands. Why do you call to remembrance, I rejoined, circumstances of which I shudder to reflect that I have been the miserable origin and author? Cursed be the day, abhorred devil, in which you first saw light. Cursed, although I curse myself, will be the hands that formed you. You have made me wretched beyond expression. You have left me no power to consider whether I am just to you or not. Be gone. Relieve me from the sight of your detested form. Thus I relieve you, my creator, he said, and placed his hands before my eyes, which I flung from me with violence. Thus I take from thee the sight which you abhor. Still you canst listen to me and grant me thy compassion. By the virtues that I once possessed, I demand this from you. Hear my tale. It is long and strange, and the temperature of this place is not fitting to your fine sensations. Come to the hut upon the mountain. The sun is yet high in the heavens, 
before it descends to hide itself behind your snowy precipices and illuminate another world. You will have heard my story and can decide. On you it rests whether I quit forever the neighborhood of man and lead a harmless life or become the scourge of your fellow creatures and the author of your own speedy ruin. So yeah, what a difference, right? Boris Karloff plays this hulking monster in the films and in this story by Mary Shelley, you're almost sad for the monster. This is just an excerpt from it, but you can see he's anguished. This monster was cobbled together from pieces and bits and is abhorred, hated by his creator. And that's why he went around you know, kind of on a rampage killing people. It's the nature versus the nurture argument. How much different would Frankenstein's monster have behaved if he'd have been raised by someone who didn't hate him and be scared of him? Of course, the whole thing is a moot point. Who can really look at a corpse and say, I'm gonna create this into something amazing. But not only is his physical form different, like at one point in this excerpt, he's talked about moving very fast and quickly eluding. Wow, that's so different than Boris's stompy version of the monster in the film. That That's kind of weird, right? Why did they change that? Also, does the monster say anything beyond like, um, a toddler's number of words in the film and in this he speaks as eloquently as an educated doctor far more eloquently than i could ever hope to in the spur of the moment speak it kind of makes you wonder what other things in this story are different and there are plenty and i really think it's a wonderful story and you should go read it for yourself because it is so interesting and well written I actually think that there is a story, and now I'm totally recalling this off the top of my head, of a bunch of writers and playwrights that got together at some kind of spooky old mansion, and during the spookums of the night, they all decided to have like this writing jam, because this is what writing nerds do, right? They all sit around and go, instead of a rap or a dance battle, we're going to have a write-off and they all wrote something interesting in form of a story and actually i'm not entirely sure memory is serving properly but there was at least a group of them like she was married to a dude who was a poet and they were hanging out with i believe lord byron possibly some other people but lord byron's idea was that they all should do this writing jam and honestly i think it was only mary shelley who finished the story and it's interesting because mary shelley kind of led a tortured little existence uh, early on there was some divorce in her family there was some suicide in her family which is of course super tragic she went on to elope with this poet which to some parents is even more tragic and she went on to have five kids i mean like it gets more and more nuts right and when she was 24 her husband dies in like a sailing accident she goes on to live only to 53 years old she all of the things that she wrote the only thing that survived really that is read today is a couple of her journals and the story of a monster another aim of this video would be to kind of talk about folds sometimes there are some creatives some artists who watch what i do and kind of want to learn some things they're a little bit newer to the craft and after a million years of me doing it some things i've learned to do decently well and i want to try and impart them so today i would like to talk about folds of fabric currently the subject at hand um folds yeah folds are a huge part of just about everything i draw and i think it lends some realism to um to whatever you're working on let me grab something okay like even everywhere this little scarf and what she's wearing around here actually that that folds a little lame but it, it kind of informs everything I do and, and gives a little sense of motion and gives a little clues as to the contour and whatnot. So I think it's extremely important that we even just start to understand the most basic forms uh, of fold. Oh, she's cute. Okay, so let me put this away. We start, I've got a couple points here because a great way to think about folds is to start from a point of tension. So if I was to hold up from my fingertips a handkerchief or some kind of piece of fabric uh, that would drape down, um, I would imagine something that would be pulled on by gravity down. So if it's gonna be tight up here, it's gonna be like a long triangle. Imagine a long triangle and at the bottom, we're just going to give it some shape, some squiggly lines. It's a great place to start. It's not strictly um, accurate, but it's a great place to start. And so basically, you have your point of tension and where it kind of winds up flowing down here. And you can draw single lines, even if they're not strictly 
um, accurate up and it gives the illusion the basic illusion that there's a piece of fabric held in somebody's little finger right here hooray where it starts to get a little bit more complex but still completely doable is and I'm gonna redraw my points so I'm a little bit closer here I've got a couple points that I'm gonna go ahead and think of um, fabric that is hanging on both of these points like coat hooks and part of the fabric is going to hang down like like a triangle like we described before a couple of them but it's also going to hang in between here like a scarf would so we're going to keep this real simple we're not going to get into like all the anatomy of folds and all the seven different kinds of folds but we are going to just kind of like talk about triangles his triangles are everywhere in folds. Um, and I've just kind of drawn a little sketchy outline of what we're going to work with here. And we're going to look for triangles. As we did here before, we see one big one right there. Similarly, we're going to find them here and here. But interestingly enough, we also find it in here and in here. All of them point into points of tension wherever this fabric is hanging from in this particular instance. So we can point and just draw some lines to that to start with. They're kind of, you know, just boring lines and they don't really have any, I'm not looking at actual fabric to draw these lines, um, but it's gonna make this look pretty interesting once I start to actually make these into little, into the triangles of their own. So I'm gonna darken up the outer part of the hanging down bits. I'm going to give myself a little bit of a shape, real simple, kind of almost cartoony and representational. Here's a bit of a fold as it comes down to. I'm going to do the outline here, just to give us an envelope, a bounding box. This is a great place to start when you're drawing fabric. If you're drawing it around someone's form, think about what you're gonna be drawing it around before you before you launch off into it. This is you know, a very simple uh, uh, example, but I had to think about first where I was going to actually put these folds and how they were gonna lie. I didn't just go at it willy-nilly. Start with the envelope. In this case, it's like this S shape here. And I started putting in the folds. This is our envelope. So now we're, we know that everything's going to point to these places, and so let's let's think about the peaks and the valleys here, and just draw some basic V shapes. Not a full, not a full triangle, but V shapes that kind of point up here. Maybe sometimes it's one line or another. Let's just do a couple V shapes here: a thin one, a little bit thicker one because they're always going to go to some kind of point of tension. Similarly here, a couple, you don't always have to do two. You can do only one. You could do three. It all depends on the form that you're working with. So now I can throw some quick shading into this so we can see this a little easier. It gives a nice illusion without being strictly draftsman-like and perfect. In this case, you know, we're pointing here and here with our triangles. What if we add just some interesting other little triangles that are kind of turned like this, almost like a smiling mouth. It starts to build up that form even more. Now this is just basic hanging fabric. And if we want to, in the future, if you guys uh, uh, you know, think that maybe that'd be useful, um, we could work on like what fabric looks like when it falls on a surface. What fabric would look like if it twists around an arm. If you've got a cylinder, what would it do when it twists around that cylinder that is basically an arm or a sleeve? These are very useful notions when you're trying to build up some interest in fabric. So you see how interesting a form can be when you make it look like it's draped with fabric. It uh, adds some contour, which we've talked about in previous videos, but it also adds some volume and some interest and a lot of rhythm, which art needs. It kind of needs a flow and rhythm. Otherwise, it's kind of boring. And uh, even abstract art tries to establish some kind of rhythm with shapes repeating one after another. Dr. Facilier, this guy is bananas. He's kind of uh, one of the scarier villains. I haven't seen the whole film. I've only seen bits of it because I couldn't really, I don't know, I don't really care. But I thought he was interesting and kind of voodoo-ish. 
and we've talked about voodoo in the zombie episode but you know i'm not going to get into that here i'd like to kind of focus on the mad science he is a doctor after all and so is dr frankenstein i <laughs> just i really liked the idea uh, kind of crafting him with a, like a, an electrical theme. He's got a weird like cathode coming out of his head and his brain or maybe someone else's brain is is housed inside of his top hat. He's got those big weird welding gloves on. I really drew heavily in this part of it from the movie where Boris Karloff was animated as the Frankenstein's monster. And so there's there's these themes of the long white coat, the electricity, the big welding gloves, and that huge switch that, you know, gets thrown and bzzzt, electrifies stuff. I gave him kind of weirdly, you know, in this case, he's not really working on the Bride of Frankenstein anymore. He's kind of like working on himself. He's got the electrodes attached to the, the vat on his head, and maybe he's trying to kickstart that, that brain. Because who knows what he's going to do next. It's actually super interesting the way, you know, I, I painted his head with that kind of transparent glass bit with a brain residing inside. And it's honestly not that difficult and, and mysterious to paint something looking transparent. You paint the container, or you draw the container, you draw what's in it, and then you kind of paint over the top some some highlights. Just just run a line across it or two that go in the direction of the, the vessel itself. In this case, a cylinder, boop, right up the middle, and a successful illusion. Uh, you know, if you did it all in pencil, that highlight could be added just by erasing out some of the pencil line. Super easy. Sometimes erasing something is as effective as drawing it or painting it. So in the film, The Princess and the Frog, it is very convoluted. If you watch it, it kind of takes place in modern times. Not kind of. It actually takes place in more modern times than any of the other films except for perhaps Lily Owen Stitch. But I'm not sure that counts. At any rate, it is very complex. There are a couple frogs and a voodoo witch doctor and there's some kissing involved but very weird and bears almost no resemblance to the original tale which is hilarious because a lot of people think of the it's called the frog prince and in german it's something insane and it's something insane like der frosch genau der einhars heinrich it's about the frog prince and his buddy henry and in the original Gr brothers Grimm tale the frog is discovered after a spoiled brat of a princess gets to know him but she actually she finds him after dropping like a gold ball into a pool or a pond and you know eventually the prince is transformed from the frog and in most cases you ask people they're like oh the princess had to kiss the frog when in fact Brothers Grimm, in grand fashion, always had some bizarre stuff to tell. They actually had the prince literally picked up a frog and threw it against the wall. Boom. Now you got a prince. Good job. That's a little strange. Kissing would have been like a, a little bit kinder treatment. Some people have read versions where the frog spent the night on her pillow and that's what changed him into a prince. Yeah likely story uh, there are two names in the name of this it's the frog prince and henry or something like that and he henry or heinrich is the loyal servant and friend of the frog prince who was so upset over his prince being turned into a frog that he had to have iron bound around his heart to keep his heart from breaking which i think is an amazing kind of image wow and then after oh boy is thrown against the wall and turns into a prince he's so dang happy that he bursts those iron bonds out of pure joy which is so much more interesting than all this other weird stuff that i recall from when i was very young brothers grim were really messed up they like had all kinds of ways of telling uh, Cinderella, Rapunzel, Sleeping Beauty, all of these things in just kind of morose ways. I don't know if they actually started all these tales or retold them in some really screwed up ways, but Grimm is right. Hold on. My cat is screaming at the door and I shall let the cat out. How's that for real? That's, that's my cat named Steve. She is huge and really loud. And evidently I locked her in the studio with me. And by studio, I mean my walk-in closet where it's kind of dark and at least it's a little bit more quiet, except for a fat cat. 
So in the story of Frankenstein, you get to know about some themes of creator versus created and love and hate. And there's actually a lot of subtle themes throughout the story that are worth exploring. There was a sequel to Frankenstein called The Bride of Frankenstein, and it is widely considered, seriously, as one of the most successful sequels of all time, like it, far better than the actual original movie. And I, I would have to concur. I mean, the original movie is kind of weird and campy and kind of lame, and so is it, but it, it had a special place in my heart. Watching the two together, it's like, wow, yeah, the sequel is definitely better. I, I can't, off the top of my head, think of any sequels that are better than the originals. No, wait. Have you seen Lion King one and a half? That's really, that's the best sequel of all time, seriously. Lion King is a wonderful little story about tattoos and whatnot, you know, vying for a kingdom. But when you tell the story of a big fat warthog and a little Timon creature thing farting and laughing through the whole, I mean, it is seriously, go watch it. It'll appeal to your inner four-year-old. So we've done a few of these episodes together where you guys have given me some ideas and I've kind of worked on them. Are there any more that you can think of? Anything interesting? What could we do with the mermaid, the little mermaid? And, and I've read the original tale of that. That is some weird original tale. So we can talk about how nuts that is. But what could we do with the princess who is really a mermaid? So this is the point in the episode where I ask you to go ahead and find the thumbs up and like the video. It's very important to me. It's important to my self-esteem. And if you've liked the video but you haven't yet subscribed, find the subscribe button, smash it so that you can know when I put out a new video. Similarly, you can find a bell down there and when you hit the bell, YouTube will send you a notification that I put out a new video. Also, don't forget to share this video with your buds because it's fun and I could use some more input on what to work on next. And finally, create. Create something. Don't create a big weird Frankenstein's monster who will run around and cause anguish and ruin. But create something, especially if it's a better day for someone else.